So they've replaced that engine, are set up for another static test where they're going to fly, you know, test it on the ground, and then get ready to fly it up to that 15-kilometer uh, altitude. After that, we'll be looking for uh, further iterations of the Starship that will be with six engines and eventually making it into Earth orbit. So stay tuned. In December, we should see some really cool things coming out of South Texas where, where the Starships are being built. But the big NASA news of the week has to be the flight of Crew-1, otherwise known as Baby Yoda on orbit. From the left in this photograph, we have astronaut Shannon Walker, pilot Victor Glover, Commander Mike Hopkins, and Japanese astronaut Suichi Noguchi. They lifted off in the uh, Dragon capsule you see behind them that they named Resilience in honor of 2020. Uh, they're going to have a six-month stay on the space station. They will triple the U.S. crew on orbit. So we, right now we only have one astronaut. Now we'll have four, so 300 times the, the science available to be performed. Uh, Japan will have a resident on the, the station for six months, and there are also two Russians currently on board. So uh, a couple of photographs you might not get to see. This is a, a Falcon 9 and Dragon capsule laying down on the Strongback launch platform inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the Dragon is uh, on the bottom right there, and the black sections next to it are solar panels that the, the capsule uses to collect solar power, convert that into electricity. And then you're seeing the, the NASA worm and meatball logos on the uh, second stage of the rocket and everything to the upper left and beyond is part of the first stage. That's what returned back to the drone ship on uh, Sunday evening after the launch. So they recovered that first stage. Here's a uh, photo of the launcher and stack out on the pad uh, the day before. So they got the fog, uh, the strong back, the birds. It's a really beautiful shot. And of course, this is the, the business end of the rocket. 727 Sunday night, they lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center. And shortly thereafter, um, that is Monday evening, rendezvoused with the International Space Station and were able to uh, dock uh, as scheduled. And again, they'll be up there for six months stay, lots of science to be done. Um, really great to see that happening. There's our crew on orbit. Commander Hopkins with the microphone, the Dragon crew in red, and the, the current station crew behind them in blue. All right, I want to conclude my time with uh, a tribute to a dear friend of mine, Mr. Dave Giesling. That's Dave with his daughter, Maddie. Uh, Dave recently passed away, and I just want to tell the folks that are here that Dave is a guy that made everything he was involved with better. His contributions to the TELUS Museum are too numerous to list but included display material that you can see as David referenced in his talk about meteorites that are on display there. Uh, expertise and support of new as well as temporary exhibits. So if you have seen the Cartersville meteorite that David talked about or were able to attend the meteorite headlines exhibit, um, you know, Dave was instrumental in, in making sure that that was uh, not only first class uh, set of material that was brought, but also the, the uh, accuracy of the information that were on the signboards and everything. Um, he also is uh, the key figure providing the meteorite giveaways that we, the Meteorite Association of Georgia was able to hand out to visitors at things like National Astronomy Day, at Meteorite Association meetings at TELUS, uh, Rockfest, and other events. He was a speaker at the museum and supported many other initiatives from behind the scenes. Um, it's been heartwarming to see that several past and present TELUS employees have made note of Dave's passing and what he meant to them uh, and to the institution on Facebook and, and through the, the International Meteorite Collectors Association. Um, we appreciate the, those comments and think it's important to honor Dave's legacy by us continuing to support the events and institutions that meant so much to him and that he supported. So we look forward to ensuring that his contributions are not forgotten and that we continue to support his legacy through our work at TELUS. I just wanted to tell you, everybody, that we're gonna miss this guy. He was really instrumental and, and a great friend, but also a great friend to the museum. So thank you for your time. And Ryan, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to entertain. Yes, thank you, Chris, and thank you for um 
Uh, tell us a bit more about Dave. Um, he also, aside from meteorites that he donated to us, um, he donated some trilobites that he got from one of his meteorite dealers, and they're beautiful, and I'm actually working on those, um, getting them into our collection. Um, so no one's been to Mars yet, but what's the timeline with, with SpaceX or things for when they hope to actually get a person there? Well, uh, Elon Musk is the one who's never shied away from a, a short timeline. Um, his intent, as he's stated, is to have uh, crews on Mars before the end of this decade. So he's looking at about 2028 right now uh, to have Starship ready to fly. That's considerably earlier than NASA's timeline. In, in NASA's timeline, it's looking like the mid-2030s before we'd have a crew there. Uh, it, it's not the same as going to the moon. There's tremendous amount of logistical work that has to take place before we can get a crew to Mars. Um, Elon is very confident in his ability to get things done, and he's demonstrated that in the past. But, but Mars is a really big challenge. So we're still looking uh, at uh, 8 to 12 years in the future before there's boots on the ground on Mars. So those of you watching, study your math, science, get involved in, in the science aspects and work that you love, and maybe you can be on that first crew going to Mars. That's exciting. And so the, the, the moon missions, that's like Artemis, and that's yeah. that's scheduled for, what, 2024? Right now, it looks like 2024, um, that would be the first mission. The Gateway probably will not be part of that. So if we put the Gateway in orbit, that will provide for a more consistent ability to get to and from the moon. So uh, regular crew rotations would take place sometime at the end of this decade. But the intent would be uh, first, uh, first woman and next American man on the moon in 2024, if we can stick to that schedule. Certainly exciting. Yeah. Well, we're going to move on to uh, Jose Santaria, the executive director at TELUS, and he's going to update us on some research he's been doing. Thank you so much, Ryan. And uh, before I get started, I really also want to weigh in on uh, Dave Beasley. He was a very good friend of the museum. Uh, he had a passion for meteorites, but also a passion for educating about meteorites and telling their stories. So uh, I, I know this is a big loss uh, to, the, uh, to his family, but a, a, a big loss to the, uh, the greater community of uh, uh, museums and meteorite collectors. But we're going to come back, come back down to, from space to Earth and talk about some uh, research and some photography that I've been doing on a, on a local level. Uh, re regarding uh, a barite, a microcrystal that I've been uh, collecting uh, mostly over the past year. So what I'm going to do is uh, pull up um, some uh, some images here, and to give you a perspective uh, of uh, where Tela sits, uh, really sits in a really mineral-rich area. There's been mining going on here in this county, Bartow County. Uh, for almost 200 years, beginning with the uh, gold rush. So you see all these mineral uh, resources around the museum, the museum being right right over here, uh, right over here between a, a couple of falls, actually. And uh, uh, one mineral that's been uh, of, uh, of important industrial use uh, is barite, but also important to collectors. Now, I'm going to show you some photographs of uh, uh, crystals that are uh, uh, on exhibit or part of the uh, our uh, Middles of Georgia book. Uh, these are these are beautiful crystals of barite. Some of these are maybe uh, uh, four to six centimeters tall. And I'm going to move to a case dedicated to barite from from, uh, from Cartersville. This is a case in the Wyman Mineral Gallery. But I'm not going to talk about these. Uh, th these have been collected at, at, at different areas throughout the uh, what's known as the Cartersville Mining District. I'm going to move to the uh, kind of southeastern part of the county uh, where my project was uh, centered, uh, just north of the um, city of Emerson, which is uh, south of Cartersville, uh, right uh, close to the interstate where uh, the Lake Point uh, recreational uh, 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 project is. And you see, um, this uh, uh, kind of like uh, you know uh, red muddy area here. This is the the one of the last barite mine. In fact, it was the last barite mine in the district. And uh, where it says mine dumps right over here, it's uh, just a pile of rocks we have collected over uh, over a couple of years. Uh, that material came from three mines. Uh, the some of the last three mines in the district. 
uh, Big Tom right over here. And you can barely see, if you see some purple right over here, that is uh, the roof of uh, Emerson Elementary School. So once the uh, mining stopped and the mine was reclaimed, the school was built on top. Uh, the DuPont mine was also mined uh, and finished, reclaimed, and uh, a new road was put on there. And then the Nelson was the last mine mined in the district. Uh, show you a picture of when mining was going on. That big piece of machine there is called a drag line. The boom, the big piece of projecting up from the uh, drag line, I think it's about, uh, I don't know, 75, 100 feet, 100 feet tall. Uh, and all these mines, uh, um, mine barite in just big chunks, not really crystals, big chunks for, for in industrial purposes. And where we collected on, here's a picture of my collecting partner, Jeff Deere, and me, where we collected is just these piles of rocks. These piles of rocks are, are, are not very significant. We've been going to these mines for more than 20 years uh, to show people what mining was about, not finding uh, much of any in crystals. Uh, obviously, we were looking for big crystals, big pretty crystals to put on the exhibit. And never did. The ones that I showed you earlier came from different areas, uh, different mines, different areas in the district. But about a couple of years ago, I started no noticing some little sparkles, uh, little, pretty little things as we started cracking open rocks. And I got serious about this uh, last year, finally got me a digital microscope to start magnifying what I was seeing. And show you, first of all, the kind of stuff that we were, uh, that, that we were uh, uh, seeing. Now, this is pretty much pretty mundane stuff. Uh, you're seeing uh, uh, what, what are called breccias. This is a amalgamation of uh, kind of different minerals, uh, barite, gertite, quartz, uh, pyrite. But we started noticing uh, bugs, uh, little holes, little voids in the rocks. This right here is called a boxwork lattice. And we started seeing uh, some nice little sparkles that we thought were uh, worth magnifying. And so uh, bought me a fairly inexpensive microscope, got very excited, bought, bought me a much more expensive one, got really excited, and it kind of went all out and, and um, bought me one that could actually take a, a different shots at different focal uh, points so I can get uh, a pretty nice, uh, uh, nice crystal of photographs. And so, uh, uh, what, what this turns out to, uh, this all turned into a project where I'm now writing an, an article to submit to a major uh, mineralogical magazine. Since it hasn't been accepted yet, I'm not going to mention it, but uh, hopefully there'll be some good news in the next month. But also the article is going to come with photographs. So I'm going to now share some of the photos that I've taken. I think I have about maybe 40 uh, crystals photographed. I'm only going to show you six or seven. Uh, of uh, mostly barite crystals. And these are not the big crystals that I showed you earlier. These are small crystals. So this one right here, for example, is a, a barite crystal about uh, uh, five and a half uh, millimeters left to right perched on a little column of a massive barite. And this is mostly what we're finding, massive barite. But then you're seeing these, these secondary crystal growth within the, within the bugs. Another uh, nice piece right over here, uh, clear barite crystal surrounded by quartz. So a lot of these uh, 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 openings, a lot of these bugs, are actually filled with a uh, tiny druzy quartz crystal. Uh, I, I really like this one. This one uh, is about uh, uh, almost six millimeter tall, and it's actually clear. It's a very clear crystal, but uh, the surrounding material is uh, coated by a kind of yellow iron oxide, and so it kind of it kind of uh, transmit the uh, the yellow coating. That's, that's behind it. And uh, this is one of my favorite right here, a couple of very nice barite crystals. Uh, these are about um, uh, six to seven millimeters tall. And once again, they're very clear, uh, kind of just that uh, the color, the coloration comes right through and you see quartz crystals all around it. Now, I did find some unusual things. And this is probably the most unusual thing that I found that uh, just has, has never been reported before. Uh, these are scepters. These are uh, barite scepters. So you have a crystal growing, and then more solutions come in to make uh, uh, to make a larger tip. Uh, these guys are uh, the largest one is about 3.3 millimeters uh, uh, tall. And if you want to get your mind around millimeters, I mean, I don't have big hands, but 
my, my fingernails are about uh, 15 millimeters across. So if you look at your hands, uh, yeah, these are going to be pretty small crystals that you may be able to detect um, a hint of them with the naked eye, but you're really not going to see uh, the, the, the true crystal um, uh, crystal shape uh, without magnification. Th there were other minerals, and so uh, I, I mentioned quartz a number of times, mostly just small sparkly crystals. But uh, this right over here is a double, uh, some double, a stack of double terminated crystals, very small. That, that one at the top is um, uh, about three millimeters from uh, point to point. And then the, um, the last photo that I'm going to show you is um, uh, this mess right over here. Now, so, uh, some of these photographs I'm not going to submit to the magazine, but I find that uh, I find it interesting enough that um, uh, that I think it's worth mentioning. This is like uh, 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 these are coarse crystals and barite crystals that are then have been coated with manganese and iron. So the iron producing that kind of iridescent red coating, and the manganese producing the uh, producing the black. So this is a little bit of a, uh, what I've been doing uh, this uh, this past year. Uh, some of the research that have kind of taken my uh, a lot of my attention. Uh, it's been fun. Uh, still working on um, on uh, getting a, uh, getting my article ready, and uh, I'll probably share uh, the latest when I when I get uh, uh, confirmation of uh, uh, getting the, uh, the piece accepted. So. That's my report on uh, local rocks. So you found those here in Barco <laughs> County. Can barite be found anywhere else in Georgia? You know, uh, barite has been uh, reported, uh, yes, in other places uh, uh, in the uh, mostly North Georgia and then around the uh, Kaolin mines. But uh, barite has, has has only been commercially mined here in uh, Barto County in, in what is known as the Carswell uh, Mining District. Very good. And so the setup that you have, what does that look like? We're, we're oh, taking okay. These pictures. Okay. Yeah. Let me uh, let me pull up. See if I can find that uh, that that photo. I may need to just uh, fast forward. Uh, to just uh, bear with me for a second. Let me go over here. I did have a slide of uh, my setup, which is uh, of course like um like most setups. It's kind of Rube Goldbergish, but uh, you see my microscope is a cylinder right over here. Uh, it's a digital mi microscope that you can plug into a laptop. So a laptop is actually showing uh, what I'm uh, what I'm photographing. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, to get a good uh, uh, crystal photograph, you need to have the right lighting in the right place, the right filters, and actually you need to have little little slips of paper like the one you see right over here, kind of blocking the light so you don't get so you, you don't get um, the um, crystals overexposed. So it, it, it takes a lot of uh, trial and error, and uh, mostly error. But uh, you know, after taking the same uh, crystal, after photographing the same crystal about 10, 20 times, after a while, you get to know what you're doing. Well, we, we look forward to the article, Jose. Thank you. Um, I've gotten to read the the couple of drafts here, and it's it's fun to read. And I learned a lot myself, so hopefully everyone else will get to enjoy it soon. Yes, and I, as you notice, I'm on version version 15 now, so. <laughs> So I guess it's to me now to share some news. Um, I'm the curator here, and I'm not gonna. I don't have anything about what's going on at the museum here. But great big news that came about yesterday was a museum in North Carolina, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Science. They received a donation from friends of the museum of a really amazing specimen. This is actually kind of a stylized cast that's a copy of that specimen. Um, it this they're calling it the dueling dinosaurs. It's a Triceratops and a tri tri Tyrannosaurus rex, probably a juvenile. But some people are like, oh, is it Nanotyrannus? That is a whole other debate of whether Nanotyrannus is actually a species or not. But that's part of this will actually contribute to that understanding of what is this. Um, we've had in the past, back in 1971, a really cool Protoceratops and Velociraptor were found in Mongolia, and these were found completely engaged. And um, let me, oh, sorry, let me, I forgot to put it for, to, for that mode. Um, they were found completely engaged in uh, what looked like fighting. The leg of one was in the mouth of the, the leg of the Velociraptor was in the mouth of the Protoceratops, and it had a claw that was kind of going at the eye. But in the, these specimens that were found in Hell Creek Formation in Montana um, back in 2006, these specimens were found lying on top of each other. And so were they fighting or were they not? 
Um, you got to look at the clues in the fossil. Um, so there's actually, it turns out that there is um, some teeth, there's some teeth in the vertebrae of the, of the Triceratops. So did those teeth belong to, Veloc to, um, to t Tyrannosaurus rexes or not? We have to find out. This is more of the research that they're going to be doing because this specimen was given to the um, North Carolina um, Museum of Natural Science by a friends of the museum. So this group actually pulled together and got local money from the city, the county, the state, and from corporations to build up the money to get the specimens. Um, here's just kind of a drawing of these specimens, more like in context of the day when they would have sort of after they died, but kind of rotted away. Um, but they think these were quickly buried when they were um, to have the preservation they have. And so this museum not only got the money to purchase this item, which apparently these specimens sold for about $6 million, um, and then they got another $8 million to build an entire research space that's going to be an expansion at their museum to work on this um, to sh so the public can see the science that's being done with these specimens. The um, frills on the, on the head of the Triceratops actually had textures preserved, so we'll actually know more about, about how what that looked like these skin impressions elsewhere we even have skin impressions on the legs of the of the tricer of the tyrannosaurus rex which will which actually surprisingly looks a lot like the leg of an emu so the te the scale textures of of birds today just look like these theropod ancestors um the question right now stands how complete is the triceratops are all the pieces there or were others taken away by scavengers we know that the tyrannosaurus rex is fully complete this is the only 100% complete Tyrannosaurus rex out there. This is another reason this specimen is so important to science. Um, there are, like I said earlier, there are teeth from this uh, Tyrannosaurus in the spine, but the teeth of the Tyrannosaurus itself are actually broken apart. Um, there looks to be some damage to the skull. Did that happen because they were fighting? Because this isn't a full-size Tyrannosaurus like Stan that you would see in a, a copy of at Tellus Science Museum, um, Stan being the um, Tyrannosaurus Rex that sold recently at auction for over $30 million to a private person. So we don't know where it's going to end up. Hopefully that person's going to put it in a museum so everyone has access to it. Um, there's actually a finger on this specimen that's broken, but this specimen is not as big as the adult Stan. It could have been a juvenile or potentially some other smaller Tyrannosaurus Tyrannosaurid species. This is part of the research that's going to happen. So here's a uh, mm -hmm. example of what people think it could uh, um, look like. And to reiterate, this was found out in Montana, um, the Hell Creek Formation. And when we say formation, this means a type, a, a layer of rock that we recognize as all being the same age. Um, so that that's um, so that's the formation that's found. There's a whole lot of other um, fossils that were found there. Um, Stan himself and other uh, fossils are from that area. Um, so a lot of interesting things. Uh, the challenge with these um, fossils is they actually ended up becoming a big precedence in, in a court case. Um, that's why these, these weren't even able to be sold until recently. They were found 14 years ago. Um, but the people who were collecting on that property, they actually had a lease for the property. So under the laws of most states in our country, if you have the lease for the property, whatever is on that property belongs to you. But separate from that are mineral rights, and so other people can own the mineral, light, mineral rights. Well, when they've tried to put this up to sell it, the people who own the mineral rights for that property sued, saying that, oh, we also own these fossils. So this ended up going through courts um, and really became a big thing when one of the lower courts actually said that fossils are minerals in the sense that they belong to the mineral right holder. Um, while fossils are made up of material that we call minerals, they aren't mineable minerals or, or, or economic minerals, and that's what mineral rights are about. So this went to even further court cases, and it was finally decided that no, these go with the, the lease owner. Um, and so that'll probably change in the future some people's way they write their leases. If someone owns the property and they lease it to someone else, they might have to put in, if they want to have the rights to dinosaurs or fossils that are found, that they own those kinds of things. So this is this is a big um, case that is big for science, big for the North Carolina Museum, but also big for um, just kind of the, the 
trends at which how we're going to treat fossils, especially these rare vertebrate fossils. Um, there's a lot of people that are against the sale of, of any vertebrate fossils. Um, in fact, the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology um, actually is completely against any commercial sale of vertebrate fossils. Um, I'm an invertebrate paleontologist, so my opinion is a little different because the fossils I work with, um, are there's a lot more plentiful, but I say if you find something that's really good and, and really excellent for what it is or rare in a locality, that definitely needs to go to researchers or museum. Um, but moving on from talking about these fossils, um, there's some other stuff about the Earth I want to talk about. Um, the Well, let's step back and look at um, COVID-19 that's been going on and a lot of researchers have actually been um, not having to travel, not going to conferences and there's actually been studies that said that a lot of these researchers, the productivity in science has gone up by 35%. One interesting aspect of that is that productivity went up mostly with the men. In fact, um, women scientists have said that their productivity have, has dropped about 13%. So um, let's pick up the slack, guys. But also... Um, yeah. We're enjoying the, 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 the fruits of time to think. Yes, people are stressed with what's going on, but they're also not having to deal with meetings and things that they had been doing. Yes, people are tired of Zoom meetings, but I think there's even less meetings by Zoom than there were in person beforehand. So people have had time to really sit down and look at their data, get stuff published, and also come up with ideas to work with big data. A lot of data that's already out there, not needing to go in the field because air travel has been restricted, a lot of great ideas have come together. This image here is actually a study that talks about um, it's from geochemistry, and they're looking at differentiation of iron that's in the mantle. Um, so we think of that part of the Earth, because you have the crust and the, and the outside, the mantle, and then you get to the core. They think of the mantle, um, in the past it's been thought of as one cohesive material, but it turns out that there's differences in that in the mantle. One of the indications of that is this um, differentiation or separation of different iron isotopes. So an isotope is different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. So a heavier isotope has more neutrons. A lighter isotope has fewer neutro neutrons. Um, that doesn't change that it's iron because that's based on the proton count in the nucleus. And so it turns out the heavier neutron, uh, heavier isotopes of iron will actually stay up in the cooler upper mantle while the hotter lower mantle that's closer to the core begins to be richer in the light iron. This has implications for our understanding of the cycling of the mantle, and in fact, as we look at material that comes up through hot spots, we can begin to understand where that stuff is originating from. Even further information um, comes out of um, research that was done recently um, on diamonds and the Hope Diamond. This is a, a specimen that is on exhibit at the Smithsonian in, in Washington, D.C. We have learned that this diamond comes from way down deep in the mantle. Diamonds do come from these hot spots that form what we call kimberlite pipes. That's, um, but these actually, the type of material in these, these are a type 2B diamond. These are have boron in them, so it's thought that the, which actually makes them um, into semiconductors. Um, mm. Interesting. But this indicates that there is some inter interference between the outer core and the lower mantle. So it's thought that that boron content and other um, features of these minerals that are coming from the deep core, are uh, the deep mantle, are actually um, enriched in material that comes out of the um, out of the mantle, out of the core. So other um, conversations about the mantle are about the silicon content of the mantle. It turns out that the ratios that we find of silica when we get samples are actually higher, and it turns out that that might be another function of the pressure and the, the, and the depth and other minerals that are related to that whole situation with the diamonds. It indicates that the lower mantle itself um, might even have separate zoning of how enriched the silica is, so the upper mantle having more silica and the lower mantle having less silica. Um, so, and that's the ratio with magnesium. So, so, really interesting stuff. But then, as you're looking down at the lower mantle, there's material that drops down from subducting plates. Um, so, even in the upper mantle, we actually have cold pieces of the plate that are floating underneath China and underneath Canada and in other places. And we can see these better because of a lot of the seismic projects that have been done. Um, one that did a whole network across North America 
some of that data now has been looked at and we actually look at events that happened you can see in this image events are in the orange stars that happened all across um, Asia and then coming across with the network that we have in the United States or had because that actually network moved across that became a gigantic seismograph um, a, a, um, a, a I'm sorry, a gigantic sonogram, basically, of the interior of the Earth. So we found these hot, dense structures that are below the Marquesa Islands and below Hawaii, and these are thought to either be um, old continental material that might reflect back to when we were, uh, before Theia mm -hmm. impacted the Earth and we formed the moon, or they could even be material that is um, remnants of that impact that formed the moon, so it could be parts of the of Theia. Um, these things we don't know yet. There's a lot more research to happen, but a lot of this big science happening from geochemistry and from geophysics and mineralogy to help us understand what's going on inside the Earth. Um, there's even this really good um, imagery here of the slab of the Pacific Plate that's going under South America. We're on this image here. We're looking at the coast of Brazil, going all the way back behind us at red, being the coast of Chile and Peru, and so. Right there at the red, you're pretty much at the surface or just underneath the coastline. And as you come down to the light purple, you are actually a, a, a thousand kilometers below the, the the surface there. So you're so you have so that's 600 miles below. So you have this cold slab is reaching all the way into Brazil underneath. So that a whole different understanding of what's going on underneath that slab that's really cold has actually gotten quite cool and is sitting there stagnant underneath and so there's implications for for earthquakes and other behavior of the surface above and then there's also the the hot slab uh, that's underneath the Andes Mountains that you still have the water from the ocean that was incorporated in that that actually is actually is what helps fuel the volcanoes because a little bit of water in with the rocks um, lowers their melting point and actually is why we have the volcanoes along that area. So all this really cool stuff seen from the big data, a lot of things being looked at um, as we try to understand our planet. Um, it's exciting to see what's going on there. It's exciting to see what's going on as we look at back in deep time with the animals. Um, I'm excited just to continue to see all these trends and see what people do with their time um, in COVID. Let's not stress out, but let's think about the big things and enjoy maybe the, the possibilities. Um, so I have um, no, I don't have any questions here. Um, do you gentlemen have any comments you want to want to interject? Well, following up on you were saying, uh, Ryan, uh, you know, uh, the silver lining. Uh, I don't think I could have done as much of my research on the uh, microcrystals if not for the time time bought because of the uh, the pandemic. So you know, I guess it's always uh, it's my little my, my little glass of lemonade during this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this are stress, stress, these stressful times. Very good. Well, thank you for your time, and thank you all for joining us and, and, and seeing what's new in science, and we'll be with you at ne um, our next um, event when, when we have it.